In the first segment of today's lesson, I gave a brief overview of the anatomy of the bony pelvis and how this contributes to bipedal motion or upright walking. Our bipedal stance is a truly remarkable evolutionary advancement, freeing our upper limbs and hands for prehensile activities. And it's amazing to think of the activities that this little modification has made in our lives. We continue our journey into the lower limb with a further in-depth look at the bony architecture of the pelvis and thigh. Welcome back. In today's second segment, we'll be looking at the framework of the pelvis and upper thigh with a look at the osteology of this region. And this involves an in-depth look at the proximal femur or thigh bone. This also serves as a good opportunity to consider the hip bones that make up the walls of the pelvis. We don't talk about the pelvis in depth until the last unit of this course, but it's hard to give a complete picture of the lower limb without discussing the bony pelvis, which is why it's included here. You've probably noticed that I've not included a discussion of the hip joint in this session. That will actually come a little later on in the unit. That being said, we will discuss the clinical implications of, among other things, a hip fracture, which doesn't actually involve the hip at all. This will make a little more sense once we lay the foundation for the discussion, starting with the pelvic bones. The os coxa, or a nominate bone, forms a bony pelvis. We previously identified the sacrum as the keystone of an arch. The os coxae serves as a wedge-shaped stone forming the superolateral portion of the arch. It's actually made up of three separate bones that fully fuse in the third decade. The view of a child's pelvis, where the bones are still separated by cartilaginous matrix, gives you a better idea of the distinction between the three bones. The largest of these is the ilium, which lies superiorly. The body of the ilium projects laterally as the ala, a Latin term meaning wings. The ala radiate away from the pelvis, forming superior ridges called the iliac crests, which serve as attachment points for the abdominal musculature. The iliac crests terminate anteriorly and posteriorly in the anterior superior iliac spine and posterior superior iliac spine, respectively, which serve as sites for muscular attachment. These lie on top of additional muscle attachment points, the anterior and posterior inferior iliac spines. Another prominent structure associated with the ilium is the auricular surface, which articulates with the sacrum medially. The name comes from its resemblance to an ear. Although a type of synovial joint, the auricular surface is unique in that it contains irregular convolutions that conform to the articular surface of the sacrum. This serves to minimize joint movements, which are generally undesirable within this specific joint. The ilium fuses with the other pelvic bones at the acetabulum, the socket which articulates with the head of the femur to form the hip joint. The internal surface of the acetabulum can be divided into the articular lunate surface, which makes direct contact with the head of the femur, and the acetabular fossa, which opens inferiorly as the acetabular notch. In an articulated joint, the acetabular notch is separated from the head of the femur by a small gap. And more on this later. The ischium, highlighted in green on the previous slide, is found posteriorly. In addition to its fusion at the acetabulum, it has a secondary fusion with the pubic bone through the ischial ramus. The pubic bone is located anteriorly. The body of the pubis lies anteriorly, with superior and inferior rami projecting laterally and inferiorly towards the acetabulum as the ischial rami, respectively. This rim of bone forms the large obturator foramen, which, as we will see, facilitates neurovascular communication with the medial compartment of the thigh. The collective protrusions and processes of the os coxae are too numerous to describe here, but will be identified in your small group osteology session and indirectly discussed in relation to muscle attachments. We'll be discussing the hip joint in more detail in a later lecture. For now, we'll address the more inconspicuous sacroiliac joint between the lateral surfaces of the sacrum and medial surfaces of the ilium. The uneven auricular surfaces limit motions at the sacroiliac joint. It might seem a little strange to have a joint here at all when you consider the complete fusion seen with the ox coxae. 
But a patent sacroiliac joint seems to have a beneficial role in sock absorption from ground reaction forces during walking and running to resist pelvic fracture. For an immovable joint, though, it has a rather complex structure. There are actually two distinct parts of this joint. Anteriorly, we see the synovial joint portion between the articulating surfaces of the ilium and sacrum. Posteriorly, we see a syndesmosis, which is a specialized type of joint in which bone tuberosities are connected through thick ligaments with an absence of a true joint space. Movement is highly restrictive at syndesmoses, which serves to reinforce the sacroiliac joint, protecting it from injury. We want to minimize movement at the sacroiliac joint as much as possible, so the sacroiliac joint is greatly reinforced through a series of both intrinsic and extrinsic ligamentous attachments. Between the posterior tuberosities are deep interosseous ligaments that directly bind both surfaces. These are continuous with the posterior sacroiliac ligaments that provide additional reinforcement. Similarly, the anterior synovial joint is reinforced by thickenings of the synovial joint capsule the anterior sacroiliac and iliolumbar ligaments. Two additional extracapsular ligaments provide further support by preventing anterior rotation of the sacrum on the ilium. The sacrospinous ligament runs from the lateral border of the sacrum to the ischial spine, while the sacrotuberous ligament runs from the posterior surface of the sacrum, where it blends with the posterior sacroiliac ligaments, to the ischial tuberosity, blending with the common hamstring origin. This lateral view will give us a better understanding of the role of the sacrospinous and tuberous ligaments. Notice that the fifth lumbar vertebrae, and hence the axial load that runs through it, is located anterior to the general position of the sacroiliac joints, approximated by the oval. This would have a tendency to rotate the sacrum anterior relative to the ilium. The sacrospinous and tuberous ligaments anchor the posterior aspect of the sacrum to the inferior aspect of the pelvis to provide resistance to this rotational force. This lateral view also gives us an important view of the three important channels for communication with the pelvic girdle and lower limb. Looking at a dry bone specimen, the contour of the ilium and ischium allows us to identify the greater sciatic notch along the posterior surface. With the sacrospinous and tuberous ligaments in place, we see that the notch is closed over, forming the greater sciatic foramen. A second notch can be seen inferior to the ischial spine, the lesser sciatic notch. Once again, in a living individual, this region is closed over by the sacrotuberous and spinous ligaments, forming the lesser sciatic foramen. As we'll see in the next lesson, these two foramen allow for communication of muscles and neurovascular components between the pelvic cavity and the gluteal region. Anteriorly, we can also see that the large obturator foramen is mostly closed over by the obturator membrane, which serves as a site for muscle attachment. This leaves a small space anteriorly called the obturator canal for passage of the obturator nerve and vessels. This brings us to the femur. As we will be addressing a number of muscular attachments in the distal region of this bone, we will discuss the most prominent features of the entire bone now, even though we will wait until next class to address the more distal components. The head of the femur is the most superior portion, directed at a superomedial angle towards the acetabulum. It is connected to the femoral shaft through the elongated neck in stark contrast to the diminutive anatomical neck of the humerus. This compensates for the greater depth of the acetabulum compared to the glenoid fossa, which would otherwise severely restrict motion at the hip. The neck attaches to an oblique bony mass formed from the presence of the greater and lesser trochanters, which serves as sites for muscular attachment. The shaft angles down towards the knee. On the posterior surface of the shaft, the gluteal tuberosity, which serves as an attachment point for the gluteus maximus muscle, blends inferiorly with a prominent ridge of bone, the linea aspera, which serves as an elongation site for numerous muscle attachments. The femur ends in two prominent condyles that articulate with the tibia in the lower leg to form the knee joint. As with the humerus, epicondyles are found in close approximation to the medial and lateral condyles, serving as sites for tendon and ligament attachment. In addition, the adductor tubercle, found just proximal to the medial epicondyle, permits attachment of a prominent muscle in the medial compartment of the thigh. 
We can geometrically describe the orientation of the femoral neck in both a coronal and transverse plane. Coronally, a comparison of theoretical lines drawn through both the neck and shaft of the femur gives us an angle of rise of the neck relative to the shaft. This is known as the angle of inclination. This angle varies from person to person, but generally falls between 120 and 135 degrees. A higher angle of inclination, known as coxa valga, is commonly seen in young individuals. Smaller angles of inclination are referred to as coxa vera. Coxa vera is commonly seen in the elderly and may be a confounding factor in hip fractures. In the transverse plane, a second line through the neck of the femur passing through the long axis of the femoral shaft can be compared to a similar line passing through the medial and lateral condyles of the femur. This provides the torsion angle of the femur, which reflects the degree to which the neck projects posteriorly. Such measures are of critical importance in the design and implementation of prosthetic hip replacements to ensure a quality fit and return to normal gait pattern post-surgery. The term hip fracture is a highly generalized term for any fracture to the femoral neck or proximal shaft of the femur. Note that the term is a bit of a misnomer. In most instances, the fracture would be considered outside of the joint capsule and typically does not involve any of the articulating surfaces. Radiography confirms the presence of the fracture and misalignment of the fractured heads. Typically, the distal end is displaced superiorly due to muscle contraction within the thigh and laterally rotated due to the strength and balance between the medial and lateral rotators. The patient therefore presents with severe pain in the lateral pelvic region and an inability to bear weight on the affected limb, which appears shortened and laterally rotated. Distal fractures can be surgically corrected with rods and plates to support and reinforce the joint. Fractures affecting the articular surface or complicated with advanced osteoarthritis of the hip may require a total hip replacement. Hip fractures are common in an elderly population due to a loss in bone mineral density. Take a look at this cross-section through the head and neck of a normal femur. Like most long bones, the femur is a combination of outer cortical or compact bone and inner cancellous or spongy bone. The porous nature of cancellous bone serves to decrease the overall weight of the bone. Now at first glance, the contour may appear somewhat random or arbitrary, but take a closer look. Do you see something of an arching pattern to the trabeculae of cancellous bone? Bone mineralization is far from random. It actually follows the compression and tension lines of force that project through the neck in a weight-bearing position, which accounts for the strength of the femoral neck in weight-bearing. A combined loss in bone mineralization, as well as the organic collagen matrix, makes bones brittle and subject to hip fracture. In stark contrast, a deficient bone mineral density in younger populations is much less likely to produce fracture, due to a higher concentration of organic matrix. This is what provides bone tissue with flexure strength, allowing for a mild degree of compliance in response to mechanical load. This is what allows the proximal femur to absorb ground reaction forces during running and jumping activities. Selective loss in bone mineralization without a loss in organic matrix makes the bone more flexible than brittle. In severe cases of bone demineralization, such as seen with the disease rickets, the bone conforms to deformation stresses, resulting in permanent bowing of the weight-bearing structures. Rickets is most commonly associated with the deficiency in vitamin D, which is essential for bone mineralization. That concludes this session on pelvis and thigh osteology. In today's final session, we'll look at the muscles and soft tissue responsible for anchoring the thigh to the axial skeleton by taking a look at the gluteal region of the thigh, which will include a discussion of the muscles and the neurovascular supply. We'll see you after the break. 